How's that for a slice of fried gold? Are you think this is a fucking costume? This is a way of life. I'll be mad. Just a flesh wound. I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. Take your sticking paws off me, you damn dirty ape. I'm sorry, Ben. I'm afraid I can't do that. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! I guess everyone's a time of one good scare. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, well, hello. <laughs> I, forgot, I forgot that I do the intro. Well, hello. And Were welcome. you waiting on someone else to do it? I don't know. I was just going to be like, oh, what happens next? <laughs> Never done this before. <laughs> welcome pod, to Cinema pod, Shock. Podcasting. What is <laughs> podcasting? I don't know. No, we have been off for two weeks. So I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, this is Cinema Shock. It's what we do here. It's a podcast dedicated to exploring the stories behind your favorite cult and genre films. I have one of your hosts, Gary Horde. Hey, I'm co-host Justin Bishop. To my left here today, Mr. Todd A. Davis. Welcome, special guest Todd Davis. Not Whoa. so special. You're just a regular ass. Oh, oh I'm yes. special. I was tested. Yeah, <laughs> very, very special. Uh, but we do have an actual special guest here today, Dan from the Film Trace Podcast. Welcome, Dan. Say hello. Hey, what's up, guys? I, I love being on this podcast. I've been listening uh, for a while now, and we had Gary on. For our nice guys episode a couple of weeks back so film trace is essentially kind of what you guys do uh we trace the life of a film from conception to production all the way to release and reception uh we kind of do it anything that's new to streaming so we do a brand new film that's premiering on streaming and then the next week we do an older film that's having an anniversary uh that's oh, nice. also available on streaming so we kind of do deep dives on that uh we just uh finished season three that was a nice guys episode the season finale we're gonna start season four uh, coming up in a couple of weeks uh, with the uh, Zack Snyder Army of Darkness. Uh, so it should be really excited. But thank you for having me on. Really excited. They do well, seasons. Yes. They do seasons, Justin. They do yeah. seasons. It's like, they don't work you to the bone. Hey, you so know, like, we we're, do that we're because, like, yeah, we used to do it weekly. Too much. Couldn't do it. We're like WWE over here. We do not give ourselves a day off. 365 to pills. days a year <laughs> on the road, destroying our bodies for the craft. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's more like the NWA over there at Film Trace, where they get, you know, they they film a a group of episodes and they take a little time off to rest. Yeah, it would take a good month off. That's all we need. So, uh, so Gary was your like finale. That was like your big shebang finale. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it worked out. I think it worked out really well. Uh, the nice guy, yeah, it was a good one. It was Gary. Uh, it was, it was a great famous. Episode. Gary can get people to give him a ride, and <laughs> like true. like literally, not just you know, hey. Let's go. We, we had looked for a guest for a long time, but then I came across your Black Christmas series. And I was like, I ah, got to yeah. get I got to get one of you guys. And I love that me. you picked Gary for an, a movie that he had never seen before. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, to be fair, he messaged the show and I'm just the only person that would talk to him. So yes, I, I was working. Uh, I was working at the time. I was unavailable or I would have come on. Uh, maybe one day down the line, I'll come on or maybe both of us or all three of us will come on if we can all get together uh but yeah i i, uh, play, I was unavailable if you play your cards time. if you play your cards right i'll come yeah <laughs> always welcome God. always welcome to film trace we're all i feel like we're a lot dirtier than film trace i felt like i had to be on my p's and q's when i was on film trace i didn't want to curse i was trying to i was i, I didn't drink i told them i was like this is the most sober i've ever been for a <laughs> podcast episode i <laughs> mean to be on your p's and q's i don't know just, it's just yeah, a thing you people know, say. Like on the ball, I guess. Is that another phrase you could use? On the politeness ball. and courtesy? No, that's a courtesy. Not spelled with a Q. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you are special, Todd. Let's get <laughs> on with the show. show. <laughs> Love it. I, I, I just, I, I got on like a whole tangent now. Like you're, you're making me look at. I, I just googled why is it P's and Q's because now I was curious, but it is not an easy explanation. So listeners feel free to go look that up yourself <laughs> just google it yourself is what you're saying <laughs> it goes back to the 19th century somewhere and then it started getting into all sorts of typesetting and stuff in printing offices and uh then i was just like, okay hey, i, I kind of that's enough information to know yeah. that that's going to be a boring discussion so. i zoned out <laughs> i zoned out saying it just now <laughs> <laughs> well let's move on to this week's film so uh this is actually the finale of our 
Dan O'Bannon series, the uh, the unsung legacy of Dan O'Bannon. This is uh, our fifth fifth film, I think, sixth film. I don't know. I, I lost count. But especially because we had to split Alien in, in half, and it's just I'm all messed up as far as how many episodes we've been doing here. But this is a big one, you know. This is a this is kind of the one we've been working towards. And the thing with Dan O'Bannon, you know, if we've learned one thing through this series, one Dan O'Bannon is a, a fascinating character. You know, like he is a difficult man, but he is undeniably a genius uh, in his own way uh, and very much a visionary. But he's never really had he, he's had a tough time up until now getting his true vision on the screen. And the thing with Dan O'Bannon is that he does he has no qualms about making his feelings known when that happens. Uh, if something that if a movie hits the screen and it's not what he intended, we found out about this with Blue Thunder last week, then it's like he will. He will talk shit about anyone else involved if he needs to. So it's kind of ironic that, you know, once he was able to finally sit in the director's chair, it was for a film that he initially didn't want to do, one that he initially was not hired to direct, and one that's actually based on someone else's property. And yet with this film, with with the movie we're talking about today, he created one of the most iconic horror movies of all time. And that film, today's subject, is 1985's Return of the Living Dead. In the dark of the night, something strange is going on. The dead have risen from the grave. Mister, there's a hundred of those things out there. How many did you say? A hundred. And now the question is, how do we get them back into the ground? Medical science is back. And it's a puzzle. Because technically, you're not alive. Why do you eat people? Not people. Brains. The military is nervous. How was your day? Usual. Crap. The police are confused. Send more cops. It worked in the movie! Well, it ain't working now. Bring the movie line! It's not a bad question, Bert. It's not a bad question, Bert. It's not a bad question, Bert. The Return of the Living Dead. 1985 saw the release of two zombie movies. The first was George Romero's Day of the Dead. Now, if you're a longtime listener of the show, you've heard us discuss Day of the Dead. We did a long episode about that back in our very first series here on Cinema Shock. We did a 10-week series on George Romero. So I would urge you to check that episode out for all the details. Uh, But here's a short little recap of kind of how this ties into the movie we're talking about today. So Romero's third zombie film was not the movie that he had intended to make. He had intended for the third Living Dead movie to be this epic zombie film, the zombie film to end all zombie films. He actually would refer to it in pre-production as the gone of the wind of zombie movies. But it, due to some budgetary restraints and things like that that you can you know, get more details on in that episode, it wound up being a much smaller, much talkier movie than he had intended. And when it was released, it was met with mixed reviews and mediocre box office returns. But part of its box office was were caused by, one, it's the slow kind of rollout of its release. Uh, instead of being released wide, Day of the Dead's distributors decided that a gradual release would be best, which was much more common back then. So that's why they did. But just as it kind of started to make a little bit of money, yield some steady returns, it was blindsided by the release of the other iconic zombie film of 1985. So if you've listened to that Romero series, and once again, I mean, I, I would highly recommend listening to it. It makes for a great companion piece for this episode. But if you've listened to it, then you know that Romero and his Night of the Living Dead co-writer John Russo split ways amicably after Romero's second movie. And it was they mostly split because they kind of disagreed on the direction that a sequel to Night of the Living Dead should take. So after this split, during a time when Romero was making stuff like Dawn of the Dead and Creep Show, you know, movies that we all know, Russo kind of split his time between writing some you know well-received novels and helping to create some not so well-received movies. But then Russo, along with other Leighton Image alums, uh, Russell Striner, who appears in the movie as as Johnny, uh, and then Rudy Ricci, they had a pet project that they'd been working on since 1972. 
which was a Night of the Living Dead sequel that was set to be produced by their own company, New American Films. So this proposed sequel was called Return of the Living Dead. And it was scripted as a straightforward horror movie. So in this script, in the original script that they had written, after the events of Night of the Living Dead, the zombie plague has gone away, but people live in fear of it coming back. They're always worried that it's going to happen again. And then when it does come back, like 10 years later, it's set 10 years after the original, it comes back and shit just hits the fan. And we've got another full-on zombie invasion. The Russo, Ricci, and Striner version of Return it was a lot closer in tone and pace to the original Night of the Living Dead than to any of its sequels. It was somber. It was dark. Uh, it actually, tell you how dark it is, it opened with the funeral of a child who had never recovered from a, a rheumatic fever. And as the girl's parents mourn, the reverend comes in and he presents her father with a large metal spike and g gives him the instructions that he, he needs to drive it through the skull of his dead daughter. So that's how the movie started. <laughs> I mean, and in the right light, that's pretty funny. <laughs> but it, it was it was a very dire story, and it had this religious cult at its center. Like they were very much um, kind of commenting on that. You got to think this was written three years after the the Manson cult uh, had oh, you know yeah. run rampant on Holly uh, on L.A. And that that reverend from that opening scene was like a major presence in the book. He he was kind of, or in the uh, in the screenplay, he was the leader of kind of this re religious organization who were kind of seen as weird fanatics by the other townspeople, you know. Uh, but they they were always focused on, hey, what are we going to do if the zombies come back? And it fe felt very much like a continuation of night of the living dead it even ended in an isolated farmhouse kind of calling back to the original movie nice. and johnny had the keys todd johnny turns out he had, had the, the keys back. all along <laughs> justin <laughs> what if he did show up with the keys <laughs> <laughs> just, just with them in his hand like <laughs> just like, he, his burnt corpse because he's you know he's dead <laughs> but he he's fried. but like hanging from his shirt pocket are a, it's a set of keys <laughs> It touches. Hey. What a stupid conversation. <laughs> <laughs> you caused this. But that, so this project never really moved forward. They shopped it around, but no producers really would bite on, on financing it. And it lay dormant until finally John Russo wrote a novelization based on the screenplay using the title Return of the Living Dead that was published in 1978. And at that time, so 1978, you know, as you guys know, is, is the year that Dawn of the Dead came out. So Russo and Romero reached an agreement, kind of an exchange of rights. And it, this was not like a legal agreement. This was more like a gentleman's agreement. You know, there were no contracts signed. But the, the agreement was this, that Russo gave Romero the rights to produce and distribute Dawn of the Dead as a direct sequel to Night of the Living Dead. And Romero gave Russo the rights to produce and distribute Return of the Living Dead just as long as Return of the Living Dead was not promoted as a direct sequel to Night of the Living Dead, because he didn't want people confusing Return of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead and, and not knowing which was the true sequel. Part of that uh, agreement I saw was that Romero would get to call all of his films going forward. They were going to be referred to as dead movies, and Russo's would be Living Dead. Living Dead. Yeah. Living Dead, yeah. So, so cut to three years later. Uh, it's 1981. An independent producer by the name of Tom Fox purchased their Return of the Living Dead property outright. And I say independent producer. Tom Fox was an investment banker from Chicago who wanted to be a movie producer and had the money to do it. So he ate, and according to everyone, cast and crew of Return of the Living Dead, he knew jack shit about making movies. He was the money guy. That was that was it. But of course, you know, so when he buys he buys the rights to Return of the Living Dead. And this worried Romero because he he was worried that that agreement that he'd had with with Russo would not you know, that they they wouldn't acknowledge that because again it was not legally binding. So Romero wanted a more more aggressive steps taken so that people would not r confuse Return of the Living Dead with his upcoming at this point his second sequel because he was working on Day of the Dead at this time. So he was now worried that they would confuse Return of the Living Dead with Day of the Dead. I even saw they, they were like trying to get Romero to executive produce or something like they had an idea for him to do that. But like he they said they tried him several times and he never responded to him or something. But, you know, mm -hmm. so they were trying to include him. 
And he yeah, didn't I mean, give I don't a think shit. it was a matter of inclusion. I think it was a matter of he's already working on something and didn't want people to think that this was a George Romero movie. That they were oh, yeah, yeah. On. He definitely and he honestly, just thought it was a bad idea in general. But yeah, throwing him throwing his name on the screen as an executive producer would have made it even more confusing. That's a good point. And then Variety did not help matters because they wrote their announcement about this. And they said that Tom Fox, who had an, an this is a quote. Fox, who had an association an association with Romero, acquired the rights from Romero and his Pittsburgh partners, which is completely r- false. Totally false, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because Romero wasn't involved at all. So then the Laurel Group, which was George Romero's production company, they responded with a warning to Fox and his production companies or the production companies that it seemed like were going to distribute the film, which included Orion Pictures, basically saying that they needed to change the title and they needed to cease any further mention of Romero. Like in any press releases or anything, no mention of Romero. We don't want this linked in any way to Night of the Living Dead. So then Variety, maybe in an effort to make amends over their previous <laughs> snafu, they actually published Romero's terms publicly. And this is how they, this is partially how they read. Your continual efforts over several years to unfairly trade upon our client's reputation have confused the public damaged our client's property rights and have made it evident that it is impossible for you to release any picture under the title return of the living dead, which would not continue to confuse the public and the industry. They were working pretty hard to block any movie coming out called return of the living dead. Yeah. That's straight out of that's straight out of a complaint in a, in court proceedings. (laughs) Yeah. Is that lawyers? Is that lawyers? Is that Romero doing that? Do you think? Well, I, I think that, it's, that reads think, that read like I said that reads like pleading. So I had a feeling because like, oh, since oh, it yeah. says tra- our client's reputation, I'm assuming it's representative p- hit lawyers yeah. representing Romero. Uh, but you got to remember, Night of the Living Dead had no copyright on it. Yeah, nothing. Uh, they so legally that makes it a little fishy. I mean, I guess you legally he could say you can't use my name, but legally using the name Night of the Living Dead, there's nothing to stop him. That's why we've had all these Night of the Living Dead knockoffs, like the animated bullshit, you know, straight to video features that are terrible that are called like Night of the Living Dead 3D and all that stuff. You know, have you seen any of them? How dare you? I I haven't (laughs) seen them. I don't know. I have seen Night of the Living Dead 3D. I watched it after uh, when we did the Romero series and it is pretty terrible. Yeah, there's (laughs) a lot of bad ones. It was was, a lot of copycats out there. It's awful. Yeah, very harsh. You used to be able to buy like Night of the Living Dead on like any horror movie set. You yeah, it to. was in all those like and, and the shittiest of quality, you know. Thirty eight remember oh, scary movies to wreck yeah. your house. I don't know. That was a weird name. <laughs> Probably. That's my next one. So Romero ends up taking the case before the MPAA's governing body. Remember, Romero and the MPAA are not friends. They've tussled in the past. And I don't know if that had anything to do with the ruling or if they were it maybe had something to do with the fact that they could say legally, Night of the Living Dead. You don't own the copyright. But either way, the MPAA ruled against Romero. I mean, you would think his name is on it. And I mean, Hollywood's known for doing things on the up and up. (laughs) (laughs) That's just confusing. When did the MPA rule against him? How close is that to when they started production of this? Two or three years. Gotcha. Gotcha. It was a it would be a, it was a couple more years. This is 1981 and it was a couple more years about 1983 before Tom Fox was able to get the project really moving. Uh but about 1983 he starts getting the wheel spinning on the project a little bit and he hires Toby Hooper to direct the movie. Wow. So Toby Hooper gets brought on. He hires Dan O'Bannon to rewrite the script because remember the script they have at the time is John Russo and uh Russell Striner and Rudy Ricci's script. So they hired Dan O'Bannon to do some rewrites on it, punch it up, and Toby Hooper's going to direct it. And and O'Bannon was kind of reluctant at first to do this. He was quoted as saying, I didn't want to make that script. I didn't think it was right to intrude so directly on Mr. Romero's turf. It was a serious sequel to Night of the Living Dead, speaking of the original script. And we know this about O'Bannon because we've seen in the past how he, you know, on Dead and Buried, for example, he didn't want to take a writing credit because he felt like he didn't contribute enough to have his name on uh, because he had had to fight so hard for his, his alien screenwriting credit of his own that he's, he seems very in tune to like, I don't want to take credit for somebody else's stuff. See Hollywood up and up. <laughs> <laughs> Hooper initially considered shooting the movie in 3d, which of, of course was very popular at the time. I think uh, Friday 
the 13th part 3D and Amityville 3D had all come out around this time, you know. So 3D was kind of the thing people were doing. Uh, but then constant delays in production forced Hooper to walk away from the project in favor of a three-picture deal with Canon Films, which began with Life Force, which was also based on a screenplay written by Dan O'Bannon. And yes, we are going to get to Life Force very <laughs> soon. So when Hooper left, Dan O'Bannon was offered the director's chair. Uh, and he accepted on the condition that he could rewrite it radically enough to differentiate it from Romero's movies. And boy, did he rewrite it <laughs> because <laughs> the by the time O'Bannon was done with it, pretty much all that remained of Russo's script was the title Return of the Living Dead and the character of Bert. The only that's the only character whose name is still there. And he even changed the spelling on that because in the original screenplay was B-E-R-T. He changed it to B-U-R-T. He's like, yeah, I changed every name. That's mine now. <laughs> <laughs> when O'Bannon originally wrote the script, by the way, he originally wrote it with Hooper in mind as a director. Uh, had O'Bannon been in the director's chair from the beginning, I think that we may have gotten a very different movie because one of the concepts that he played around with, and he actually went as far as to do location scouting in Mexico City, was uh, one of his original ideas was having a group of Americans running into mummies during a Day of the Dead festival in Mexico. Oh, wow. Nice. <laughs> I feel like somebody did that eventually, didn't they? Like a, a sequel like to sequel to sequel, Night of the Living Dead, yeah. Day of the Dead or something. <laughs> that does feel right. Yeah. Also, weirdly enough, he also had initially changed the title, the, just the spelling. It was Return of the Living Dead, D-E-D. So wow. he had oh. done that, too. I thought Todd was the professional comedian. Here, really. <laughs> uh, no, I changed the A to uh, to another E and made it all about real estate. So it was not a uh, uh, living D. This is good. <laughs> and, uh, oh, wow. We, okay. can, we can keep this going. <laughs> it's <laughs> Todd A. Davis, writer, comedian. So it's, <laughs> that's how we go with that. Over on all bases. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the film would be produced by... Hemdale Film Corporation. I looked into Hemdale Film Cor Corporation and their, their history is kind of fascinating. Uh, they're based in England. They're a company that was founded in the late 1960s by a film producer named John Daly and a guy named David Hemmings, who was a British actor known for his roles in Michelangelo Antonioni's Blow Up and probably most notably for our listeners as the lead in Dario Argento's Deep Red. Ah, yes. Profundo bullshit. <laughs> Gary, you sons yes. of bitches and your hate for deep red. <laughs> how do you, Dan? How do, Dan? How do you feel about Dario Argento? Are you familiar with the work of Dario? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Dan. Are you on Justin's side? <laughs> these these uh, guys. He, he, he's a master. He's an absolute he's a master. master. And we're gonna do an Argento series one day. On oh, you show. have to. Yeah. yeah. If There's we so much to go through, through. It, we'll, uh, uh, we're sorry, gonna kill I it. I have something to do that weekend. So, so much <laughs> schlocky stuff to go through. <laughs> so. This Hemdale Film Corporation, they began their life, like, they weren't a film producing company at first. They were kind of a management company. They actually managed acts like Black Sabbath. Like They were nice. Black Sabbath managers before moving into film production. But when it did, uh, it moved into film production. It, it struck a deal with Orion Pictures for distribution. And they produced films like Hoosiers, Platoon, uh, The Last Emperor. You know, they've done a lot of big stuff. And at the time that they were doing Return of the Living Dead, uh, when they started work on that, they were in the middle of producing another classic genre film, which was James Cameron's The Terminator. Mm -hmm. And a lot of behind the scenes people that worked on The Terminator would subsequently work on Return of the Living Dead as well. One of those was, was Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, yeah, he's 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 there in the he's in the graveyard scene. Is he tar tarman? Is that who he was? He is <laughs> trash, actually. <laughs> Complete body transformation. <laughs> that's was a, that your Arnold that, zombie that's, voice. Yeah, that's Arnold like as that. a zombie. That's good. <laughs> then Arnold made a zombie movie, didn't he? Yeah, with that girl from Little Miss Sunshine. Oh, yeah, yeah, what was it called? Wait, uh, what? I missed yeah. this one. It's called oh. like maggie or something it's, it's like it a, yeah. Maggie, yeah like 2000s yeah. 2010s one of those oh ones. yeah like four mm -hmm. years ago probably it's like she it was after he was governor or something yeah it was one of those first movies after leaving office i think is this like straight to dvd quality what are we talking about oh, i haven't I, seen it so I it looks I like a, it, it looks like it takes theaters. itself too seriously to be honest <laughs> <laughs> it looks like one of those zombie movies that's trying to be like art you know a like metaphor it's, it's, it's social yeah, commentary it's a father and daughter who doesn't yeah. want to get behind Have you seen that? it? A, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Have you seen it? 
Well, no. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> so one of the people from Terminator, one of the behind the scenes crew members that worked on Return of the Living Dead was the casting director, Stanzi Stokes. Her work on that film for him, though, got her the gig on this movie. Uh, because they were really happy with what she had done. So when it comes to casting on Return of the Living Dead, O'Bannon really wanted fresh faces for the cast. Uh, but he did mix in a few veteran actors in there as well. Uh, one of those actors was one that was actually cast by Toby Hooper, James Karen, who uh, listeners of the show will know appears in Toby Hooper's Poltergeist. You know, he's Craig T. Nelson's boss in Poltergeist. Nice. So he was actually cast early on, but he ends up playing Frank, which is one of the film's leads, in a role that was originally actually written for Dan O'Bannon himself. But when Karen, Karen kind of knocked it out of the park on his audition. So he was given the role. And also once, here's the thing, once Dan O'Bannon came on as the director, there were, there's no way in hell that those producers were going to let him also star in the movie being an unproven first time director. You know, that just wasn't going to happen. One actor on the film that Stokes had worked with before also was Linnea Quigley. Uh, Stokes had cast her in Silent Night, Deadly Night. You guys, I don't know if you've seen it, Todd. I know Gary's seen it. The first Silent Night, Deadly Night. She gets impaled on um, on deer antlers by the killer. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, it's a great scene. And nice. she's also fully naked in that uh, because that was kind of Linnea Quigley's thing. That's her thing. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Uh, but uh, that Silent Night, Deadly Night had kind of helped establish her as like a scream queen. But it was her role as trash in Return of the Living Dead that really cemented that title. And she would go on to become like probably one of the most well-known scream queens of the 1980s. Weirdly enough, Jewel Shepard, who plays Casey, was originally going to be trash. And her name in the movie was Legs. Legs, yeah. They changed Mm -hmm. a couple names from the script. Dan O'Bannon met her at a strip club. So she was already dancing naked. Jewel Shepard is an incredibly interesting character to listen to in interviews. Because she is sure no is. barred. She is. Uh, she she was a stripper. She's she's done porn. Like she's she and she's very just open about everything. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure she really disappointed Dan O'Bannon because I mean, like when you hear her talk about it, she he was like he came in and he just stared all the time. But she's like, I found him fascinating, so I that's started what talking do to at him. strip clubs. Yeah, it's true. It's uh, <laughs> yeah. It's- that's a, it sounds like he point. went there a lot, though. Like, it does. It does. Like his hangout. Well, she they said he was a, really they, they interested have, in this they have other an girl buffet. That's that's what that's what people <laughs> legs and eggs. I mean, that's a thing. <laughs> legs and eggs. <laughs> she she talks about him like, uh, well, he was really interested in this one girl who had like a Betty Page look, but she got knocked up, so couldn't use her. <laughs> so he finally came back to me. I always liked Dan. He was really cool. He always bought the drugs. He paid. He tipped well. Like he was. <laughs> She she like tells like all of this stuff, but yeah, by the she time is. she he like uh pitched the role to her, she was like, I'd been in one movie, like it was like raw deal. She was like, I was naked in that movie, and then I'm naked all the time, and I just don't <laughs> want to be naked anymore. <laughs> so I just said I I'd rather play this Casey person. He's yeah. like, But but you're naked, that's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> that's literally your job. And she's just like <laughs> she's done with it. Like, uh now He's I don't an want interesting to anymore. character, man. I would actually like to, I would like to read her. She's got an autobiography called If I'm So Famous, How Come Nobody's Ever Heard of Me? And I would, I think it would be a blast to read because she's just very interesting to listen to. She's fun. She just has zero fucks to give. (laughs) She'll say whatever she wants. This is just a little fun fact I saw from a commentary track where Trash is dancing on the grave of Archibald Leach, which is the real name of the actor Cary Grant. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> Just that's the name that's on the grave. Yeah, <laughs> that's wow. so weird. I know, very, very odd. But anyway, very just thought strange. that that would be worth sharing. No, anyway, oh yeah, it. so she convinced uh, Dan O'Bannon to let her be Casey because she's the party girl, and she's like, you know me, I like to party, so I could be the party girl. <laughs> so, there you go. Always think. Well, another actor cast was Brian Peck. He had uh, previously appeared in the Last American Virgin. He was cast as Scuzz. Brian Peck ends up doing a lot of stuff on this movie because he ends up puppeteering and like doing a lot of behind the scenes stuff just because he had experience and was willing to do it. It's, he's more of an integral part of this movie than you would think because Scuzz is kind of one of the side character punks. You know, he he gets killed fairly early on and he's he's got a good look, though. He's got a cool look. He's got more of like that British mod punk kind of look with the long trench coat and stuff, mm-hmm. you know, uh, which he went out and bought himself. Nice. Uh, that trench coat. He, most of the punks actually 
ended up dressing themselves with the exception of like suicide. But Brian Peck, he says that when they were originally trying to dress him, he was just dressed all in leather and chains like suicide. He's like, he's like, I look like a miniature version of this guy. So he, they let him go out and kind of build his own, his own wardrobe. That's cool. And the, I think some of the pins on it are like movies that he likes. Like, I think there's a Jaws pin on there and stuff like that. Yeah. So he, cause he got to choose them all. Then you had Beverly Randolph cast as Tina. You had Tom Matthews cast as Freddie. And this is actually Tom Matthews feature film debut, although he would later go on to genre greatness as Tommy Jarvis in Friday the 13th, part six, and technically part seven, but it's the same footage. <laughs> He's not the only Friday the 13th actor to appear in the movie, though. So Miguel Nunez Jr. and Mark uh, Venturini, who Spider and Suicide, they were both in Friday the 13th, part five, which also came out the same year as Return of the Living Dead. Spider dies on the toilet. In that yeah, movie enchiladas uh yeah. spoiler he's, he's <laughs> taking a poo and his girlfriend's singing to him through the outhouse door yeah, yeah. and they're going like woo 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 woo, 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 woo. <laughs> they're just like doing that back and forth to each other the jason case and, and one of the worst friday the 13th movies oh uh, it's uh, yeah, uh, nearly unwatchable what fun <laughs> It's terrible. <laughs> Nearly unwatchable Not, but fun. That's that's the description I would give most of those Friday the 13th sequels. <laughs> uh, other key veteran actors, you had Don Calva as Ernie and Clue Gallagher. Gulliger. Gulliger. Gulliger? Gulliger, yeah. Gulliger? Yeah. As he played Bert. So Gulliger was an actor who'd gotten to start in the 1950s working on westerns and things like that. He was on several TV shows as a regular before becoming known for roles in films like The Killers and The Last Picture Show as like a character actor. But throughout the 1980s, he became kind of a fixture in low-budget horror movies, starting with this movie. This was his first horror movie, and he was kind of a last-minute hire. I think he got hired like the day before shooting began. Why didn't he uh, kill a zombie by uh, smashing it with a with a big mallet? Gallagher's not. Oh, Gallagher. Right? Is that oh, Gallagher? I but... see what you're doing there. <laughs> That's funny. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's available Is for anything parties. anything Gallagher related Arments really funny? Corporate events. <laughs> oh man, he was uh, he was he was like best friends with uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, oh man, now I'm gonna hate myself because I can't remember the name of the actor. It was like a cowboy actor. It was, it was not John, John Wayne. John Wayne. No, it's not John Wayne. Plenty See, I knew that was exactly good. Uh, Bruce Stern. Viggo oh. Mortensen. God, I hate this. <laughs> <laughs> Sam uh, Elliott? But like an old-timey one. Howdy doody. <laughs> uh, never mind. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it, he just uh, seems like a really cool guy. He was like a... He, he got his start doing a bunch of stuff like... Uh, he, he was friends with like Robert Ludlum, who wrote like the board books. Oh <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and his other friend ended up being this cowboy guy that I can't think of his damn I mean, he's name. Still, I, he was in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I think it was most, most recently. He's got like one small scene. It's like a cameo. But he d- he did a lot of horror movies after this. In fact, he's in the movie Feast, you know the movie Feast, uh, yeah. which was directed by his son. Well, now you you know who else was he... always on set? Was George yeah, Clooney on the set of this movie? Yeah, because he was best what? friends and roommates with Tom Matthews, who played Freddy. So really? he would come hang out on the set. Wow! And I just, <laughs> just another little interesting tidbit. Yeah, could have had George Clooney in Return of the Living Dead, but they missed he out. was busy doing the Killer Tomato. He's just busy returning to Horror High. Yeah, Return to Horror <laughs> High, which is one of the better <laughs> horror movies of the '80s. But Justin yeah. doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the character that Don Calfa plays, Ernie, his full name—I don't know if they ever say it in the movie—but his fir- full name is Ernie Kaltenbrunner. And he's named after a real guy named Ernst Kaltenbrunner, who was a Nazi SS soldier who supervised the gas chambers in Nazi concentration camps. Uh, so Dan O'Bannon named him after this guy. Uh, this guy was captured by the U.S. after the war and executed by hanging, you know, tried on war crimes. But it's very intentional on Dan O'Bannon's part. And Kalfa kind of ran with it when he knew that information. He sneaks in some like German phrases into his dialogue here and there in the movie. And then you also hear Ernie listening to a song on his Walkman called uh, Panzer Roland in Africa War. If I said that correctly, it's all German, but it's like a Nazi anthem. And then he carries around, I think it's a Walter. I think they were going to give him a Ruger, but it kept getting caught in the holster or something. So he has a Walter and there's a photo of Eva Braun on the wall of the mortuary. So he's very clearly supposed to be like a Nazi who has come to America 
and <laughs> integrated himself into our society. And he's still burning people. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of it's kind of fucked up. Well, you I know who I was I, thinking of is Buster Keaton. It's Buster Keaton is who I'm thinking about. <laughs> What and I was thinking of cowboy, movie movie was Buster but Keaton. it's not a cowboy. <laughs> hey, speaking of Nazis, Buster Keaton. Yeah. <laughs> it just came the to famous, me. The famous cowboy yes. actor, Buster Keaton. <laughs> thinking it about was. Nazis and uh, burning the Jews just made me think of Buster Keaton. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> just click. Did you guys pick up all the Nazi stuff when you were younger and saw this? Oh, no. Because I didn't definitely pick up at not. all. No, then, definitely But like, not. I went back and saw the notes and stuff. I was like, oh, yeah. It's all very, it's pretty much on the nose the entire time. It's pretty time. on the nose once you know it, but it's yeah. yeah, I mean, it's not as far as like him like it's not like Doctor Strange Love where he does a <laughs> a Nazi salute yeah, or anything. Salute, yeah. <laughs> but it's pretty I mean, it's they're not hiding it, you know. They're just not bringing a lot of attention to it. The question's why though that I could The I, question I, is why because it doesn't have anything to do and and he's <sighs> kind of a character you're supposed to like. He's very you know, likable. He's but, one yeah. of the more likable characters in the movie. So I don't know what O'Bannon's intention was other than he thought it was funny and it entertained him. Listen, say <laughs> what you want about the Nazis. They're, oh, God. Todd. Likable. Todd, why are you trying to get us canceled? <laughs> this is our first episode. We're gonna You're going to take down two shows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's over. <laughs> well, another key role in the movie that's often overlooked was played by an actor by the name of Alan Troutman. So Troutman was this very thin actor who was a puppeteer. He was a, trained as a dancer. And he, in the film, would don the costume of one of the most iconic zombies in film history, so the Tar Man. And the guy who was responsible for giving us Tar Man was production designer William Stout. So William Stout, before Return of the Living Dead, Stout had done some design work on Conan the Barbarian. He had done storyboards on Raiders of the Lost Ark, on uh, First Blood. O'Bannon had met him and first seen some of his work at parties at Ron Cobb's house. Ron Cobb would have these parties and uh, William Stout would show up and he would, because I guess everyone at these parties were like other artists and things like that. And he would show off his work to kind of get opinions and feedback. And Dan O'Bannon was always enthusiastic about his work. He liked what he did. So when it came to do Return of the Living Dead, he was one of the people that O'Bannon considered to be production designer. The other one was Bernie Wrightson, who, you know, he had worked with uh, previously uh, because Bernie Wrightson was involved in heavy metal. O'Bannon gives his, sh this like short list, this wish list to his line producer, a guy named Graham Henderson, who was hired by him to kind of oversee the whole production. And Henderson chose Stout. Henderson's, a, you know, he's a very, he's an experienced producer. So he chooses William Stout because William Stout had already worked on a few movies and already had the experience. Whereas Bernie Wrightson had not, he was a, an artist and a comic book guy. And William Stout ended up being one of O'Bannon's closest collaborators on the film. I, I think it's not hyperbolic to say that Return of the Living Dead would not be the movie that we have now if it if anyone else had been in that role. Because that, that's how integral William Stout was to the creation of this movie. He, he gives a lot of credit to O'Bannon for like the thought process that went into some of the stuff. Uh, you know, one of the interviews I... I had a quote from him where he's talking about they asked him what, what were the key differences that they were focusing on when they were making the movie and he said ours was the first zombie film to have fast zombies you can outrun Romero's zombies but not ours ours was going to be the first film which brain eating would be crucial to the zombies life and existence plus we were determined uh abandoned wanted what was called principal corpses he said in quotes uh, very distinctive zombies visually, not just guys with dark rings around their eyes. Uh, the Tar Man is a good example of one of our principal corpses. He wanted unique zombies for the annals of film history. I mean, that's kind of something that Romero was doing with Dawn of the Dead and stuff, too. They had their like star zombies here and there, you know. Um, I mean, in Day of the Dead, we got yeah. Bub, obviously, well, that, but you you had a couple of those in, in Dawn of the Dead as well, where you had like everyone in the background is kind of just a rambling zombie, but then you'd have a couple here and there that were featured a little bit more that had more mm -hmm. unique designs, like the one in Dawn of the Dead that ends up on the poster of the movie. Well, it's also kind of like, uh, you know, the standard fair stuff on The Walking Dead, which ends up kind of being the Greg Nicotero ex exhibition show. Like oh, yeah. Every sure. episode. Let's have, you know, some sort of weird looking featured yeah. zombie. It's the only good thing about that show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Tony Gardner was also in this as a great makeup artist. This was yeah, like his first. There. Oh, yeah. Maybe you're bringing that up. Okay. Well, I'll just leave it alone then. 
I'll talk about something else. How about the, another thing that uh, Stout talked about too is they that he said O'Bannon like from the beginning when he rewrote that they had the idea of Abbott and Costello versus versus Frankenstein. Uh, that that was a big influence, you know, to play the horror straight. But yeah, uh, that makes sense because I mean, Abbott and Costello versus Frank or Meet Frankenstein is really kind of the first, uh, probably the first horror comedy, right? But the reason that it's so good is because the Abbott Costello stuff plays like Abbott and Costello stuff. Yeah. And the horror movie stuff plays like a horror movie. You know, they're not mm-hmm. making it a joke. They're not making the horror a joke, uh, which I think makes it more effective. And and that's really what they do here, too. I think it's part of what makes this movie work so well is because they treat. I mean, this one leans a little more towards the horror side than the comedy side. Uh, there aren't like jokes in this movie. Not really. There's right. not like jokey dialogue or anything, but there are it's situational funny stuff. In fact, a lot of the cast that did and did had no idea that they were making a comedy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Clue Gulliger had no idea that they were doing a comedy. And even on set, like it was hard to tell what Dan O'Bannon's intention was for tone. James Karen was one of the guys who kind of knew what was going on, but the oh, younger yeah. people were like, I, what I'm, I'm going to play it straight. Essentially is what yeah. they're going to do. But Karen, James obviously Karen is the top. He's fully playing, like leaning into it. Oh, like, yeah. He's having a blast. He's my favorite to watch in this movie. He's my favorite character to watch in this because he's just all in. Like he's going over the top in a way that he would, because if you've seen him as an actor, you know, you've seen other instances where he's fairly subdued. But in this, he's he's leaning into the camp side of the of that character. Well, that's kind of one of the old rules of comedy. It's like the more serious you take it, the funnier it is. So if that's kind of your plan, don't tell your actors to say, Hey, just play it straight. Like this is, this is really happening. And you end, I think you end up getting more honest reactions. And when you've got characters so over the top, like these are, it just lends itself to the funny. But Clue so, Clu Gallagher does not seem like he has much of a sense of humor. He's very serious. I mean, I don't know. He seems like he's having fun, but he would apparently is more cantankerous than Dan O'Bannon. I was reading stuff like he, you know, is carried around a lead pipe, but they had to replace it like halfway through. Cause he would get pissed off and just start smashing shit. Well, no, I don't think it was. He, I don't think he was actually smashing anything. I think it was him and Dan O'Bannon clashed on set so much that Dan O'Bannon had them replace it with he was just a rubber pipe because he was afraid that that Clue was going to hit him. <laughs> because uh, it wasn't like it wasn't like Clue Gallagher was was running around and smashing the set. It was that him and Dan O'Bannon seemed to hate each other on the set. And he threw like a can at Dan O'Bannon's head at one point. So yeah, he had it replaced because he thought that the next thing thrown at him would be a you know iron pipe. So he thought it might be a good idea to replace it with a rubber pipe. And they just told Clue that they had misplaced the actual iron one. Besides that live <laughs> stuff, I mean that's 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 the kind of stuff that's interesting about Clue too, because he just seems like he's led quite a life and uh, just not suffer fools. And he's yeah. he's also just a he's a, he's a wild man. Like they. I watched a panel discussion about this movie where they're all there and they were asking him like, Hey, did you do the, where the tar man, you hit him with the bat, knocked his head off. Was that all done in one take? Like how'd that work? And he was like, yeah, yeah, that was done in one take. It was a little person inside the tar man suit. And there was a head on top of his head. And Dan was like, he's going to come at you and you got to swing this thing. And you got to nail the fake head and knock it off. Do you think you could do that? And he was like, yeah, I could do that. He said, as it happened, he was like, I don't know if I could do this. <laughs> and he's like, so I did and not it. hit the actual person. Inside <laughs> yeah, not of kill the <laughs> actual little person inside the costume. And uh, he said it worked. He was like, but, I, but he said, literally, he said, yeah, but I don't really know. But I did it. I probably shouldn't have done that, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, one decision that Dan O'Bannon made that would be pivotal to the film was that he had all the actors rehearse. He set aside two weeks of rehearsals before filming began, and they would go through the entire script, like, repeatedly, in sequence, like they're doing a live play. Like, he would have their marks taped out on the ground. You know, they, they were like in a warehouse, and they were essentially doing Return of the Living Dead as like a play over and over again for two weeks, just kind of to build chemistry between the actors. And it's probably another reason that clue did not feel as welcome on set is because he was hired so late in the process. And that affected how he interacted with everyone else on set. Everyone else had spent two weeks living this movie, you know, in these, as these characters before shooting began, James Karen would later say, he said, quote, it helped everybody 
and we all got to know each other. By the time we were shooting, we all had ideas about how to turn others onto interesting things, meaning that you know they were able to really live in these characters and bounce ideas off each other about the characters and things like that, which I think you can feel that in the movie. I think there's a there's these all these kids, they feel like they're really friends. And you know, some of them give shit to each other all the time, you know, but it feels like a real group of friends who would act that way. You know, when you make a war film, you send all your actors to boot camp. If you're making a football movie, you you have them do two a days for a week. If you're you know, doing a space chemistry. movie, you just shoot them off in a SpaceX exactly. rocket. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's how you do it. That's how movies work. Yep. Dodd Kalfa has a great story about playing Ernie where he says, like, O'Bannon would, you know, when they were doing the rehearsals, if he didn't like something, he would get mad. But then he would just, like, take over your character and would, like jump into it and he knew all of the parts really well so he would act it out so he said before he even really got to his stuff with Ernie he was watching O'Bannon with I forget who else he said he watched him play the role of Ernie and he was just sitting back and just like watching him and he said well you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna do an impersonation of Dan O'Bannon doing Ernie when I go in in the rehearsal (laughs) so he said he did it uh, the first time he was in front of O'Bannon and O'Bannon was literally like, God damn it. That is perfect. This guy is a genius. That is right on the money. <laughs> <laughs> so he plays, he plays Ernie as Dan O'Bannon for the whole movie, basically. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so the film was shot with a budget of about $4 million beginning in May of 1984. Uh, most of the production took place in an old warehouse. It was like a Harley Davidson warehouse in Burbank for resurrection cemetery. Uh, you know, which is where, the the action really begins. William Stout transformed an old oil grove into a graveyard. They built foam, a foam gateway, that archway, you know, and they filled it with basically every fake tombstone they could get their hands on. Like Dan O'Bannon wanted like just graves everywhere, like way more than you would see in an actual graveyard. They were way Mm -hmm. too close to each other, but he wanted it to look crowded so that you would believe that there'd be just a lot of potential zombie bodies coming out of that ground, you know? So at, at one point, uh, the company that Hemdell had hired to manufacture all the film's props and set dressing went bankrupt, and they couldn't get the stuff for Return of the Living Dead that they had already paid this company to manufacture. It was stored at this place's facility, and they weren't able to get it. So William Stout had his art director and his set director go to this place in the middle of the night and climb over a chain link fence and break in and take their stuff they they were like, hey, we paid for this shit. It's ours. So they they had to they had to do a heist. <laughs> nice. uh, they had they had to do they had to do a heist and steal their props from this prop production company that had gone out of business. <laughs> Where's you that know? movie? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That'd be, I'd watch that movie. <laughs> I was reading a little something too that like the idea for the uh, morgue or you know the the lab where the the Freddy's coming into work. Uh, where they're talking about the skeletons, like having perfect teeth and the, he's like going through that whole thing. O'Bannon said that came from alien that they had skulls on the set of alien and they were like perfect and had perfect sets of teeth and they looked real. And he was just like, where do these come from? They're like, uh, he said that somebody there told him, it was like, Oh, you get them from India. Like they're, they're just like, <laughs> they're real and they just do it for like medical stuff or movie props or whatever. And you can order them however you want to or something. And he's just like, that is so fucked. And yeah, so- I mean, we talked about that during Poltergeist, you know, that yeah. they used real skeletons in the pool scene at the end. And that's where everyone thinks the Poltergeist curse comes from. But it's like, no, like human skeletons are used in movies a lot. It's cheaper to buy a human skeleton than it is to like to carve human. and yeah. mold a human skeleton from scratch. So. He said right after this movie came out that he saw a news story about that that company that sold them all in India getting shut down, like the government was standing in on or stepping in on like not selling human bodies this way or something, something (laughs) like that. He was like, I don't know if this movie had anything to do with that, but the timing was really weird. (laughs) So within the first few weeks of filming, the production hit uh, another issue. William Munns, who was the film's makeup and effects designer, uh, him and O'Bannon clashed a lot. One thing you'll hear a lot as we talk about the making of this movie is so-and-so clashed with Dan O'Bannon a lot. This happens (laughs) frequently on this movie. Uh, But according to Munns, the reason that they clashed was because O'Bannon would kind of micromanage even the smallest of details. I mean, O'Bannon, he came from that USC film school auteur-driven filmmaking style where he thought that the 
director had to have his hand in every little thing. So maybe he was over extending himself as a first time director and trying to really like do everything. Munz tells a story where they had a shot where of the graveyard and there's these little mushrooms in the foreground and Obana was on the ground for like 20 minutes, like just tweaking where the mushrooms were for this shot that, you know, was going to be two seconds long. If things weren't right, if things weren't the way that Dan O'Bannon thought they were, he would, his temper would, you know, that's another thing we've learned about O'Bannon. The dude's got a temper. According to Munns, quote, his attitude was explode in rage first and then listen to an explanation later. Mm. So him, they did not get along. And they, I don't think they ever got along, even after this. Like, if you listen, if you hear even more modern interviews from William Munns, like, he does not like Dan O'Bannon and did not like his experience making this movie. So one of the things that drew criticism from O'Bannon was the uh, the animatronic skeleton that Munz created that pops out of the ground. You know, it's an iconic moment in the movie. Uh, it pops out of the ground and then grade 45, uh, the party time uh, song kicks in. O'Bannon didn't like the look of it. And William Stout, who had, of course, painted the original design, that was his his thing. They called it the first corpse is what they referred to that skeleton as. He had created this and it looked like a skeleton popping out of the ground, but Stout wasn't happy with it either. He said that Munns did not put, this is a quote from William Stout, Munns did not put himself into the story we were creating. He didn't make it real for himself. How can you explain having a corpse burst out of the ground and not having any dirt on his face? So that was their problem with it was that it comes out looking like a clean skeleton. You're not taking it. I guess O'Bannon seriously. was okay with it in the he uses it twice in the movie because it, it's at the very it's end of the movie end. as well. <laughs> yeah. So he yeah. must have been okay with it in the in the long run. That's pretty bad. He fires the guy that later on he's like, that's actually not that bad. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, this worked after all. But yeah, so this wasn't just O'Bannon and Stout teaming up to beat up on William Munn. Like a lot of the cast and crew made very similar sentiments. Like pretty much everyone who's interviewed about this, like if you talk about William Munns, like they're Nobody really thought he was doing a good job or they thought he was phoning it in, you know. Uh, but we also know that O'Bannon was not easy to work with. Uh, and he was, even previous to this, known for kind kind of flying into a, a rage at the drop of a hat. Uh, I think probably it was that, in my opinion, I think what you have here is a clash of personalities. You've got two guys who just are different enough to where they're never going to get along. Uh, and I think that's really probably what happened. Although. You know, William Stout, maybe he's just being loyal to O'Bannon and things he says about William Munns, but it was not a not a great situation for anyone involved. No. And it was too much for the production to bear. So William Munns is let go. And in his place, a guy named Tony Gardner is brought in at the su- suggestion of Brian Peck, the actor who plays Scuzz, actually. They'd worked together on a previous project. And Gardner gets brought in, and his main role when he first arrives is to design the half corpse that Ernie interrogates in the movie, you know, the, the woman, on the woman corpse on the table. Mm. So when they bring him on and they're like, you've got two weeks to build an animatronic model of this corpse. It was uh, the producer who came in Henderson. He came in and and told him this and it was kind of like saying it in a way where like, Hey, if you don't get this right, you don't have the job. And Tony Gardner says that, you know, he was kind of a dick to him when he said that, but it sort of motivated him. He he kind of realized later on that that's why he was kind of being a dick to him was to motivate him to do this quickly. Uh, So he did. He built it in two weeks. Uh, They built this puppet. And when it came time to actually shoot the scene, Brian Peck, once again, comes to the rescue and he, he steps in and he's a puppeteer. He uh, he's actually controlling the mouth of that on set and speaking the dialogue on set. Of course, they replaced the dialogue uh, with an actress later, an actress by the name of Cherry Davis did the actual dialogue that we hear in the film. But yeah, Brian Peck, who plays Scuzz, is essentially performing as the the half-woman corpse puppet. That half-woman's so hot. (laughs) (laughs) It's a chilling kind of scene, I think. You know, well, she talks about the pain, right? Oh, so that's yeah, what I the eat way, brains. Yeah, and her delivery on that, the way that she says the pain, you know, like it's really sad, and it also gives you an insight into the zombies, and in, in a way that had never been done in these movies before, like gives them a reason, like why are they doing this? It's to like try to offset the pain of being dead. Like that's kind it's of dark. terrifying. This whole movie's yeah. super dark too. I mean, it's a it comedy, is. but you know, the end. It's a comedy, but stuff. it's it's very cynical and very dark. 
Yeah. It's got a nihilistic streak going on. Absolutely. I mean, all the way to the very end. Yeah. You know? But props to them because they launched Tony Gardner's career. And that guy's been, I don't know that he designed the bat nipples, but he worked on Batman and Robin. And, uh, <laughs> but we'll I think say that was, he's responsible for the bat nipples. I think the only thing he had done here was like work on uh, one like Starman with as a part of Rick Baker's crew or something uncredited. And uh, the John Carpenter movie. Uh, yeah. And so he, but right after this, he goes on to Aliens. He does the Lost Boys. He does uh, the Blob. Night breed, yeah, nice. He's done and, some cool uh, stuff. Yeah, Dark Man. He's like he was like the special effects designer there, and Sweet. Uh, yeah, he was no he he designed Daft Punk's helmets. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, so he's he's like all over the place. He got he got investigated. I was reading about it, but he got a just a side note that movie Three Kings. Remember that? With like I watched yeah. it last week. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> well, yeah I, I rewatched that last week. Where the somebody gets shot up and it shows like the special effects, like uh, the bullet traveling through the body, yeah, going through and hitting like the he got the bile duct. Yeah, the Arizona State Police like investigated him because they had been convinced that there was like this homeless person missing or something, and they thought he had used an actual human body <laughs> to like <laughs> film that scene. Oh and, wow! Uh, so Tony Gardner <laughs> seeds some shit, man. But it all started right here. Oh, wow. the dead. <laughs> so another new addition to the crew uh, around this time was a special effects artist by the name of Kenny Myers. Uh, Kenny Myers had worked with Roger Corman and Charles Band on kind of low budget horror movies before moving into more mainstream stuff. And he would he would later do the Back to the Future sequels. Yeah. After this, uh, parts two and three, he did the first Austin Powers movie. Nice. Todd, he also did Star Trek five and six. Very cool. Or subsequently, the worst and one of the best of the original crew movies. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's cool, man. That's uh, There's your Star Trek reference for this episode. Always got to get one in. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's connected to Star Trek or Roger Corman at some point on these shows, and this guy happens to be connected to both. (laughs) So this guy, uh, Kenny Myers, he's the guy who's in charge of prepping the tar man shoot, the the tar man suit for shooting. And by prepping, I mean that he had to take the pieces of it that he had found in a box where William Munns had left them. Uh, and it was totally unassembled, just a bunch of pieces in a box, and they had to shoot it in like two days. So according to Myers, he said, quote, I had to make it functional. The jaw was not properly built. The eyes sucked. The suit was not assembled. Assembled. It was really a heap of crap in a box. So he had to take what William Munns had just been like, well, they fired me. Fuck it. I'm just going to throw <laughs> this in a box somewhere and had to essentially finish it and make it wearable and, and screen ready. Wow. Yeah, the stuff that's dripping off of him is like, uh, they call it like Methacel or something, I think was the name of it. And it's the stuff yeah. that they use. And this may be, maybe this, I didn't think about it till now, but this could be a gardener thing um, because it's uh, it's like a thickening agent they use in milkshakes. But uh, it's also what they use to make the blob later in the remake. Oh, nice. It's also, <laughs> what, it's also what brings all the boys to the yard. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of thick, I mean, I milkshakes are made with ice cream and milk mm-hmm. and some sort and of apparently syrup, this yeah. and apparently this i don't know i i, I read like it on the internet like so use. i know it's true it says the thickening agent used to milkshakes <laughs> it's probably like what they use at milkshakes at like mcdonald's and places like that you know yeah yeah not like an actual milkshake anyway that's weird though for the fact that he two days before shooting had a, essentially an unusable version of tar man and he was able to make what is one of it's probably my favorite movie zombie is impressive. I mean, because the tar man is outstanding. And part of that is Troutman's performance. Like he he moves in a way, I, I think it was it may have been Kenny Myers who said it, or maybe William Stout, who they were describing his performance as tar tar man. And they said like he moves like he doesn't have any bones, like he doesn't have any joints. He just moves in this weird way that only a dancer could. And the way that he shambles is super weird, but creepy, like really creepy. I just, I love that tar man design so much. It's just the coolest zombie design to me. Yeah. I mean, it's the yeah. iconic zombie. I think of a movie, would you guys agree? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think, I think the most, probably the most like recognizable zombies from movies 
you've got Tarman up there and you've got Bub up there. And I think that's pretty much it as far as like super recognizable, iconic zombies. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously a lot of them have moments, but these tar man's in this a good bit, you know, compared to the other zombies in this. And he really is like Gary said earlier, they were trying to create like an iconic, you know, recognizable zombie. And they, they hit the nail on the head with tar man. I think. Yeah. He, uh, that, that guy is just, he's, he's a natural for these kind of things. Like I think uh, Troutman like goes on to do, uh, I think he's in like Muppet stuff a lot. I think he was in yeah, dinosaurs. He does a lot of Muppet stuff. Yeah. Uh, the show dinosaurs. Um, just all kinds of I things mean, he, where he you need up, to move like a weirdo. Yeah. He goes to work for Jim Henson company after this. And which if you're a puppeteer, I, I would imagine is like the goal. <laughs> <laughs> if you're yeah. a professional puppeteer, that's who else would you want to work for? But Jim Henson. Yeah. So there was one other effect that William Munns had created before his dim- dismissal. And that was the, uh, I think I can't remember who referred to it as somebody along, uh, on the production referred to it as the privacy prosthetic that Linnea Quigley wears in her graveyard dancing, that famous graveyard dance scene. Uh, Graham Henderson had told Dan O'Bannon, he's like, we can't show her pubes in the scene. Dan O'Bannon was adamant that she was going to be fully naked, full frontal nudity, but they're like, we can't just have her dancing full frontal with her pubes, like right there on the screen. So Dan O'Bannon's like, okay, Lania, can you just shave your pubes? <laughs> and so she did. And then they went to shoot and Graham Henderson goes, he like flips out. He's like, Jesus Christ, Dan, we can't show her like that. Now you can see everything. So <laughs> O'Bannon had a, a essentially like a cod piece kind of thing designed and manufactured to cover her up. And William Munns had to create that. So she is wearing underwear essentially in that scene. It's just flesh colored and it gives her a weird Barbie doll crotch. In the, yeah. In it's the very movie. bizarre. It does not it's look very right. strange. <laughs> it's very strange. Hey Todd, hey, why can't Barbie ever get pregnant? I don't know. Why can't Barbie ever get pregnant? Because Ken comes in a different box. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> uh, anyway. Wow. Thanks, Gary. You're welcome. I like that you just had that joke in your back pocket. I know. It was just there, ready to go. You triggered something in my brain that reminded me of that. <laughs> this um, sounds like a joke you learned from Gary Sr. <laughs> it really does. It sounds it like does. a Gary Sr. joke. It, it 100% is likely something he told me at some point. Well, there, there's a lot of pressure on Dan O'Bannon to kind of nail this movie. I mean, pressure that was put on himself by himself, mostly. Wait a minute. Um, See, like, now you're just going to, I don't, I'm sorry to cut you off, but you're just going to like dance right past the Linnea Quigley. Like we're just not going to spend any time on this talking about, tell me this is a life changing, changing moment for you as a child. As Seeing a Linnea on, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Did you guys first iconic... see this on TV or like video rental? Because I saw it on TV. I think I first Monster saw it on Richard. VHS. Okay. And I was probably in, I was probably about 15 or 16 when I first saw this. Because yeah. that was around the time that I was going to the video store and renting like every horror movie I could find. Right. And the VHS of Return of the Living Dead is rad. I mean, that cover is still amazing, you know, with the punk rock skeletons around the grave. Mm-hmm. So I would rent things based on the box art, as we all did at the time. And so I, yeah, I was at the perfect age at like 15 or 16 to watch this. And it just like rocked my world seeing her dance on top of that. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, and you were rock hard. I mean, yeah. I probably was. Let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen, we woke around here, but like, we got to be honest about some things. This is a, a, a an important, iconic scene in movie history. Yeah, this is a sexual awakening for many young men. <laughs> do you think it was written that way, or do you think that Dan O'Bannon was like? I think Dan O'Bannon's a little bit pervy. To yeah, be honest, it seems that way. I think he legitimately clubs, was like, "I right? want a naked woman dancing on a grave," and yeah. he went for the other girl from the strip club. That's probably why it was at that strip club. It was like, just gotta find the right one. And or maybe uh, he was at the strip club and got the idea, like, let's. This is fun to watch that's true maybe we should throw it <laughs> maybe we should put it in the movie hey it turns <laughs> out strip clubs are kind of fun <laughs> he, uh, so yeah i don't know but it's a it, and lania quigley is really fun in this movie to be yeah. honest like her her like monotone delivery of everything i think is really really great she's got a great look with that like weird like bright red flat top wig on i don't know it's just 
And then she, when she shows up later as the zombie version, that's uh, wonderful. It's a, Some it's, ways she I mean, gets all warped and gets like a thick napkin. Weird, yeah. <laughs> weird face. Yeah, it looks like she's, she's a, an alien. Looks like she's a vampire from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I was curious. So if it was just me or if it was other people, but I even found in 2011, Mr. Skin, you, you know, Mr. Skin, you remember him? Uh, yeah. I assume he's still around. Um, he's probably still around he was asked for his all-time favorite nude scene and he said quote if i were going to single out my all-time favorite nude scene in a horror movie specifically it would be linnea quigley's graveyard strip and return of the living dead for decades i thought she went full frontal but the miracle of high death has realized or revealed that she's wearing some kind of rubber prosthetic over her crotch normally i'm appalled by any kind of trickery like this but linnea's turn as trash remains my pick for the greatest fright flick turn on Dan O'Bannon, you know, he's under all this pressure to like get this right because again, this is his first time directing a movie, so he's really got to just prove himself, or he thinks he's got to prove himself. He's got to prove himself to his producers and to everyone else who, you know, still think of him as just the guy who wrote Alien mostly. And he took a lot of that pressure out on the cast, it seemed like. I mean, we've talked about him in, in Clue. Uh, Jewel Shepard, you know, she tells a story where he nearly made her cry by yelling at her in front of the whole cast and crew because she couldn't deliver the line, go choke a chicken, the way that he thought it should be said. You know, so he's like, he says something to her like, I hire you to act. Everyone else here is acting. Why can't you just act? Uh, like he's being a real asshole, basically. Dan O'Bannon was kind of an asshole. Uh and she's like, I dance know, for you and you bought me Coke. <laughs> <laughs> and part of the reason that him and Clue uh, Gulliger, the reason that they clashed so much, one of the biggest reasons was because Clue, who, who is a you know veteran of Hollywood, he took issue with how O'Bannon spoke to his cast. Uh, he didn't like the way that he treated them, especially these younger, younger actors. Uh, although I, it should be noted that Clue Gulliger and, and O'Bannon would kind of they would, I don't know if they like just apologize later on, but they, they ended up being friends later on in life. Uh, they would do Q and A's together and things like that. Like they became friends and they were friends actually until, uh, until O'Bannon's death in 2009. So they made up after this movie, but on the set, they, they seemed like they wanted to kill each other. Dan O'Bannon, he's, he's got all this pressure on him and you've got, he's got these producers at Hemdell who don't really seem to believe in him or they didn't like him. Uh, and they and they would make that pretty apparent. Not to mention that Dan O'Bannon is still suffering from Crohn's disease at this point. Uh, he is oh, yeah. he would fall God, ill during shooting that. several times. There are some days that he'd have to leave the set and spend hours laid up on a cot, you know. And it, he was just in immense pain, which is something, of course, that probably contributed to his temper. Uh, he was he was cranky because he didn't he felt in, he was in pain all the time. Mm. Cast members, though, you know, despite all the stories you hear about return of the living dead and about how hard of a shoot it was and all the conflicts on set and the fights on set. A lot of the cast members still talk about the fond memories they had on set, the friendships that they made during the shoot people that they're still friends with to this day. Except William Munns, who was quoted as saying, I'd say having a triple root canal on a back molar without any Novocaine would have been more pleasant than working on that set. So he still holds a grudge. <laughs> But after months of a stressful and difficult shoot, the, the film finally wrapped and goes into post-production. Actually, can I drop two bits of knowledge real quick for you? Sure. Please do. Did you know that some of the extras on this movie were paid bonus money to eat actual brains <laughs> in the film? Like calf <laughs> brains? Holy and, shit. Yeah. And I think Dan one O'Bannon, of them was a little... The, the guy who's missing all his, his limbs. Wasn't he one of them that I ate oh. actual cat brains? Yeah, I think that's right. And Dan O'Bannon didn't want anybody to do anything that he wouldn't do himself, which is why I learned all their lines and did the rehearsal stuff. But so he ate some calf brains himself, which I don't know how it affected his Crohn's, but uh, there you are. So, did, uh, did Dan O'Bannon probably didn't help. also shave his pubes and wear a, a privacy <laughs> prosthetic? He did. He did. <laughs> He danced nice. on that same nice. grave on Carrie nice. Grant's on grave. Carrie Grant's grave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they also had to get approval for using Lysol at one point during the movie because uh, when he was like, when Frank's tried to spray away the the quote unquote stitch of death, 
But that was easy to get because Lysol was very happy with the idea. They said they liked the idea that Lysol could kill any conceivable odor. They thought it was great advertising. <laughs> so. Nice. Right. But anyway, forward, forward thinking marketing story. department. <laughs> I don't know wherever where else those facts would fit except right now. And what else am I going to do with this knowledge besides barf it out on this podcast? So I, just had, to, I had to tell you those things. Keep it tucked away in your privacy prosthetic, Gary. <laughs> My wife is tired of hearing about this shit. <laughs> <laughs> so as the film was in editing, a, an unusual turn of events ended up being pretty key in what has become a, a major element of the film. So a guy named Bud Carr had been brought on as a music consultant for the film. He had worked with the producers on The Terminator. And one day they call Carr into the editing bay to listen to the score that they'd received. Uh, the producers had told him that the score had just come in the mail with no notes, uh, no uh, no idea as to where the cues should go in the movie. It's just they got a reel of tape with about 15 minutes of music on it. <laughs> so they're like, uh, they're like, we're a little concerned that, you know, this is not going to be enough music for the film. And Carr agrees because 15 minutes for an hour and a half hour and 40 long movie is certainly not enough music so he starts working in some music that he brought in to consider using in the film at certain points like a needle drops here and there but he starts using them like putting them in the movie more more prominently and they started using them in parts of the film where a score might normally be like setting scenes to these songs almost like a music video and the producers loved the idea. They brought Dan O'Bannon in. They're like, what do you think of this? They showed it to Dan. Dan O'Bannon loved the idea. And thus, an iconic horror movie soundtrack was born, featuring music by The Cramps, uh, The Damned, 45 Gray, uh, Roki Erickson. Like, it is a killer soundtrack. And it's used, you know, like, like I said, pretty extensively in the movie to where there are long portions of this movie that do feel like you're watching like a punk rock 80s music video. Uh, it's rad. And it's part of, I think, one of the things that have built a cult following around this movie uh, is the soundtrack, that punk rock soundtrack, because it's it's really outstanding. I mean, Surf and Dead by the Cramps, like that's a fucking great song, you know, and it's and the way it's used in the movie is so good. I, lo I love it. I've, I listen to the soundtrack fairly regularly. Can you imagine it with a normal score? Like how, how so much weird. would that change that movie? I mean, it's, I mean, I think it would. It I think absolutely it would fundamentally makes the whole thing. change the whole feel of the movie, don't you? Yeah, like the vibe it, would be completely different. It would. It really would. And because they were going for a punk rock vibe for this whole movie. So the idea that they even considered using a more traditional score is weird to me. I mean, they one of the issues that I, I didn't really discuss when we were talking about the casting and the filming of this is they had originally wanted to cast like actual like punk rock kids. Uh as the, the main characters, and they realized none of these kids could act, so they brought in actors to to portray punk kids, but that's actually part of one of the points of contention with William Munns is that that was not communicated to him. He thought that they were going to have like these kids come in that already look like punk rockers, and they'd already have their hair made up and all that, and then they that didn't happen, so William Munns had not budgeted to make up, turn all these normal-looking kids into punks, and was not happy about having to figure out how to do that. So they ended up sending the kids to a, uh, a hairdresser in Los Angeles. That was like a legit punk hairdresser with like a three foot Mohawk. And they got all their hair done, like suicides, weird geometric, sh you know, shape shaved into his head and stuff, which is cool, except for the fact that they didn't have anyone on set to touch it up. And you shave somebody's head. It's going to look, it's going to have stubble, the next day and longer stubble the next day. So they finally, they had to like, this is all stuff that they had not worked into the schedule or the budget that they had to then figure out. So same thing with like uh scuzz having to create his own wardrobe and stuff, you know, uh, it, it all kind of, a lot of these issues on the film honestly seem to stem from Dan O'Bannon, not being very good at communicating to his crew. But so I can't imagine this movie with any other kind of music in it. Yeah, the wow. music's actually a huge part of it. And then the the actual score, like the compo like if you look on IMDb, it doesn't even list his name, I don't think, but a guy named Matt Clifford worked on this and he's like listed in the soundtracks and stuff like that, but uh for the actual score stuff. 
and this is the only movie he ever did but he's like mick jagger's buddy and uh huh. like frequently plays like keyboard for like rolling Stone stuff and like collaborates with mick on writing songs and stuff like that but he did the he was the composer for this film and uh and that's also a weird thing i can't i could i tried i could not find like why <laughs> like he just yeah i mean and maybe it's so weird that he only maybe that maybe his inexperience is why they just got a reel of tape in and with no cues because he had never done a movie score before and didn't know that that's something you're supposed to do maybe yeah. he's just like i'll just send him some music they'll figure out where to put it in you know <laughs> yeah maybe that's but it that's not really how that works that's <laughs> how <laughs> scoring a movie works so Return of the Living Dead was scheduled for release in late 1984, but its date was pushed back to the following spring to allow for a little more time for editing. And then further complications caused it to be pushed back even further. And it was finally released on August 16th, 1985. This is about a month after Romero's Day of the Dead had been released. And as that film was rolling out, uh, you know, like we said, it was a gradual release but Orion Pictures did a full wide release. They were Orion was pretty confident in this movie. I seen they did like a full on wide release, big marketing campaign, and they just went balls to the wall with this movie. And unlike Romero's film, unlike Day of the Dead, Return of the Living Dead ended up being a hit. It made back its budget almost immediately, and it went on to earn over fourteen million dollars at the box office, which on a four million dollar budget is pretty damn good. Yeah, critics were on board too. Uh, Roger Ebert, we talk about him a lot on the show because he hates horror movies, it seems like. His quote from his Return of the Living Dead review says, it doesn't make the mistake of Day of the Dead, talking too much. It's kind of a sensation machine made out of the usual ingredients, and the real question is whether it's done with style. It is. I love that. I love the description of this movie as a sensation machine. I think that's sort of perfect because it is. It's like... It's the music, it's the visuals, it's everything. We're kind of all working together to just get you kind of stoked about watching this movie. If we could just talk about uh, Lydia real quick for a moment. Uh, <laughs> no, um, I actually stuck my note about this way down, so I just wanted to mention it. Dan O'Bannon on the commentary does say he he did make that scene just for sex appeal. And that yeah. was what he was going for there. And he was surprised at the premiere of the movie with how many women were actually at the horror movie. He didn't realize that it would be like that. He thought it would be like a mostly male audience. So this would be like something that would appeal to them. And he said that that was uh, quote a mistake I'll never make again. Um, <laughs> he said if he would have known that he would have such a large female following for this film, he would have also had Freddie naked in the movie too. <laughs> <laughs> equal opportunity yeah it is interesting like why it works so well i mean because it is yeah. a really specific tone and vibe to the whole thing why do we think it worked is it just magic with everything coming together or is there something that we can like pull out that that really was different or new or unique? i mean i think that one one thing uh we, we mentioned a little bit earlier but i think part of it is because it does treat it's a it's a comedy but it's not a comedy in like a jokey way it's, it's not a parody uh, which I think is a big, a big, uh, a big part of it, and it it's fun and funny while still keeping the horror stuff serious. You know what I mean? It has this breakneck pace to it. Yeah. Like this movie wastes no time getting going because you yeah. it it sets things up before the opening credits even roll. Like it sets up the whole background. I love. The, one thing I love about this movie is it's kind of the meta quality of it, where it treats Romero's original Night of the Living Dead as a movie in this universe, you know? And it sets all of that up. It gets it out of the way before you even see the title of the movie on screen. You literally see the title of the movie on screen as Freddie and Frank are unleashing the trioxin and, and starting basically the plot to the whole movie. They get all that exposition out of the way in the first like three minutes of the movie. And then the movie never slows down. Like it just hops from one set piece to another. I mean, there are talking scenes, but they're always fun and funny and kind of slapsticky. And it's like this, here's the thing. The way that I would describe return of the living dead is all killer, no filler. It's yeah. just 
fun. The ho- yeah. There's no fat on this at it's all. Just it's just one giant fun. Sub 41 album. Yeah, Sub 41. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the script, I mean, O'Bannon had to like, the script is so tight. It is. And it's like any exposition is done in action. Like they're yes. telling something, you know, uh, when they're doing something. Uh, and so it is, I remember watching it, I watched it last night just to sort of um, get back into it. And by the time the ending came, I was like, wait, it's already over. Like, yeah. it's just like, boom, boom, boom. And then it's over. Like, this, that's, you just want to go back and watch it again. Yeah. It's, it's a really tight script that only gives you the information you need. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't give you, it gives you just enough information. You don't know really what trioxin is, how it works or anything. Cause it doesn't fucking matter how it works they they go yeah. into it a little bit more in the sequel uh which is not great but they they give you a little they like all sequels tend to do like they give you more information than is really necessary because they forget what made the first movie work mm-hmm. uh and i think that's part of it though is that it's just he knew just like he did an alien honestly like how much information to give that's enough to set the story in motion without worrying about the details like an alien you don't know who the company is uh you get all that information you get all the information about Whalen yutani in the sequels to alien uh you get all the information about what makes the xenomorph work like what they're they're all the bullshit from prometheus that you don't need to know to enjoy alien you got so much anger uh, for because dan o'bannon knew that <laughs> that the audience doesn't care it doesn't um, matter you know, uh, I mean, fanfic stuff is fun, but it's it's fun. It's more fun for the audience to try to work that stuff out in their mind, I think, than to show it on screen. And I think he kind of understood that. Todd. Yes. Did you like this movie? I do like this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's kind of. Uh, yeah, I mean, we said it. Uh, I think Dan said it earlier. You start you once you get into it and then the end credits roll and you're like, oh, wow, that was really fast. But yeah, yeah. it's a tight script. Uh, they keep everything, you know, short, sweet to the point, and we're moving right along. We've got our, uh, you know, I think the uh, prosthetics. I mean, we mentioned the iconic, uh, the tar man, tar man. I almost said oil man. I was like, that's not it. Uh, <laughs> the tar man. Uh, that's a uh, Daniel Day Lewis. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly, and he would that's- say to this tar man, "I will drink your milkshake." So, <laughs> how's that for a movie joke? <laughs> that's a great movie joke wonderful <laughs> wonderful well done i'm proud of us as a group guys you gotta Honestly. be a movie nerd for that <laughs> yeah yeah um <laughs> no but i think i think they you know uh necess- um necessity is the mother of invention and with the copyright issues that kind of sort of set the stage with like all right here's some things you're gonna have to navigate around and then the other thing they had to navigate around was their own leader, Dan O'Bannon. So working under those constraints, you got certain performances, not just cast, but like from the crew as well, to create this little slice of a mov- movie that's iconic and so rewatchable. Um, oh, yeah. With, uh, you know, with a soundtrack to boot and... uh yeah, it, it's it's solid. It's solid from beginning to end. It's funny because this movie had so many clashes on on set and so much working against it mm. that it it pulled through and not only created a movie that works, but that works incredibly well and is still you know iconic. Thirty six mm. years later or whatever. Yeah, and Timeless. and you have to wonder Timeless. if those if those the all the things that were working against it ended up working for the movie. Like, what if this had been a smooth shoot? Like, would we have still gotten this movie or yeah. is that conflict part of what fuels the movie and created the movie that we ended up with? Exactly. Uh, because like, what if William Munns had not been fired? What would the half corpse lady have ended up looking like if he'd have been the one in charge of it? Or what would Tarman have ended up looking like if, if uh, Kenny Myers had not had to take over and, and fix it? You yeah, know, exactly. uh, so those con- those things all work together. By the way, speaking of <laughs> listen, zombies, listen, real quick, diamonds, I- diamonds are made with pressure. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. That's what I never mind. I don't know. I was going to make a joke about <laughs> pooping. <laughs> um, no, you know, who doesn't give enough love zombie wise, though, is the yellow uh, nut job at the beginning that yeah, yeah. comes bursting out of that room. Like I, that one's always yeah. memorable to me too. And you never hear anybody talk about that. So I just yeah, wanted to fun. take a moment. 
Uh, but I mean the the um, one well, thing we didn't say before. Cut off. They uh, the split dogs. What a great yeah. gag. And the little and the butterflies, the pen butterflies yeah. always get me. But like, what a great gag because nobody would have thought of that. And it only works in the in this as a this kind of zombie movie because of the way that they reanimate the dead in this with the gas. You know, uh, it wouldn't work in any other way. But it's just little little details like that work so well. So Dan, one thing that you guys do on Film Trace that I really like is you always discuss kind of like you always ask like where did you first. Like, what's your history with this movie? Where did you first encounter it? Yeah. When did you first see it? Uh, so when did you first see Return of the Living Dead? You, so, you kind of indicated before that you grew up with it. Yeah, so I have a distinct memory of seeing this um, on Monster Vision, I think, for the first time. Hell yeah, uh, with Joe Bob? Yeah, with Joe Bob. Cool. And so it's one of my distinct memories of Monster Vision is watching this late at night. I think it was a Saturday night. Uh, and the thing that stuck out to me when I was younger was the ending. Uh, and how brutal it was. It just ended yeah. with a nuclear explosion killing <laughs> all of your characters. Not only a nuclear explosion that kills all of your characters, but doesn't fix the problem. No, and nothing <laughs> solved. And and also, like, the leads, like, I guess you would call, like, Frank and Freddy the leads to start out with. Uh, Freddy dies, essentially, and becomes a zombie. And then Frank uh, burns himself to death. I mean, that's just bizarre. I mean, that's really yeah. dark. Which, that was James Karen's idea, by the way. An oh, oddly okay. sweet death for his character. Like, that yeah. his kisses his wedding, wedding ring. ring. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was James Karen's idea on set to do that. And so I think, yeah, when I was a kid, I saw the Monster Vision. I was just, like, super intrigued by the whole thing. And then when I was probably in my 20s, I went back and got it on DVD or whatever. And then you get the full sort of experience yeah. with trash with and everything full, like that. The full trash um, scene intact. And it just, there's something about it. And I watched it with a friend last night and she had probably seen it in 20 years or something like that. And she goes, you know, this is way better than I remember. It's one of those movies, I think, where you kind of throw it out as sort of, oh, it's a funny kind of silly zombie comedy thing. But you look back on it, and obviously as we've walked through it, it's a really good film at the end of the day. It's a yeah. weird movie uh, with an odd tone, but that kind of adds to the allure of it. Um, there's not a lot of movies like, like this. It doesn't feel like anything else. No, not at all. I mean, the silliness of Karen mixed with like the nuclear like Holocaust at the end. Yeah. You're like, what the hell's going on here? Yeah. It's a um, it's a really unique feeling movie. Uh, do you can do you guys consider this like Dan O'Bannon's? Is this his magnum opus? Magnum opus? Yeah. I would say so. I yeah. would say even more so than Alien, because Alien was a product of of him and you know, and, and Ridley Scott and Walter Hill. Like there are a lot of other hands in Alien. Uh, Dan O'Bannon's a big part of that because, you know, he he's the guy who hired H.R. Giger. But this one, even though it was technically based on someone else's script, like he literally like just threw the rest of the script out that John Russo had written. And this is the closest thing to like an auteur type vision from Dan O'Bannon as we would ever get. And he was notoriously hard to work with. Uh, I mean, he it, it, that probably contributed to him not really directing anything else. He did one other movie uh, later on that he directed that I haven't even seen. I think it's based on an H.P. Lovecraft uh, story. But I think it's kind of a shame that he never really directed anything else. But I kind of get it because he seems, again, very difficult. And I feel like he might be just stronger as like, Dan O'Bannon's got a huge imagination and he's, he's an idea man, not a great people person, clearly not a great people person. So I think that maybe he's a better fit to be a writer. So Gary, uh, one thing we got to talk about, we all seem to really like this movie. I know you like this movie, Dan, Todd, all seem to, we all seem to be big fans, but I bet there are some people out there in the world, in the world wide web who are not huge fans of this one. Yeah, it turns out, even with Return of the Living Dead, uh, some people got overly upset, and somebody <laughs> needs a nap. <laughs> My first review is from Sherry Baker, and uh, she gives it one out of five stars. She says, uh, the title of her review is Garbage. She says, I gave it 20 minutes, and I want them back. I thought this was a horror comedy, but it isn't either of those things. 
The scene where they beat the dog was vile and very unnecessary. The sounds were realistic enough that they freaked my dog out. That's a review. <laughs> the scene where they beat the dog? The half dog. Yeah, half the dog. dead tried dog? To kill it. That. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is from Amazon customer. One out of five stars. <laughs> the review says, I just want to party. One out of five stars. I recently finally saw this movie and I really enjoyed it. My favorite type of horror movies are the ones with zombies and this movie pulls it off. I especially like the fact that it is Uber 80s. It was awesome. And one star? One star. Wow. <laughs> I just had maybe to throw that one they, in there. I don't know. Maybe they that's why they... Because uh, they don't know how to rate movies. <laughs> yeah. Sounds familiar, Todd. Well, come they on. get more fun. <laughs> Amber Amber says, one out of five stars. I don't like horror. And that was the title <laughs> of the review. <laughs> the review actually goes on to say, don't like horror. This was a gift for Christmas. I'm sure they would enjoy it very well. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. This, this, they just had some stupid reviews. There um, are some pretty dumb ones. Here's Kid O'Connell with one out of five stars. It's bile. Mix it with deplorable grade school humor. What do you get? Excrement. Utter trash. I won't allow it anywhere near my collection. Pathetic. It is for the same people who think that Deadpool is a good movie. And equally <laughs> full of humor. I don't think so. <laughs> it kind of sounds like a good review a little bit. I mean, if you flip it. Uh, all right. Yeah, we'll, we'll move it. A couple more here real quick. Uh, Dane Smith calls it the stupidest movie he's ever seen. When I first watched Return of the Living Dead, I had already seen the sequels, and I wasn't really expecting a lot of this one. When I got done watching it, I realized I lost an hour and a half of my life. And then I got mad. First of all, the actors suck. I thought they were just stupid, no-talented morons. Second, there was the fact that it was a slap in the face to the zombie master, George A. Romero. Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, Land of the Dead. He gives like his whole filmography here. Uh, <laughs> Zombies are supposed to die when they get their head or brain destroyed. And this, in this one, they completely destroyed the zombie, cut his head off, caught him on fire, and he still came back. Then there was the fact that they could think and make decisions and talk. That's stupid. I said this to a friend once, and he said it ignored the Romero classics because it had nothing to do with them. Then why is it called Return of the Living Dead? All caps. It's just a cheap <laughs> spinoff to get some fast cash. As a horror movie, wasn't scary... It wasn't scary at all. It is a comedy. It isn't funny at all. The only thing funny or scary about this movie is the idiot who would spend good money on it. Forget this. If you want to rent a zombie movie, rent a Romero movie or Resident Evil. Oh, no. Mm, no. Resident <laughs> Evil. Okay. <laughs> wow. Uh, one more. Uh, terrible movie, Rises from the Grave. That's the name of this one. Uh, the name of this reviewer is Art Vandelay Importer Exporter. Mm. Oh. <laughs> Vandelay Industries? Yeah, uh, yeah. Vandelay Industries. Easily one of the most incomp incompetently acted and directed movies I have ever seen. Ever. But that's not all. The makeup's bad. The costumes are terrible. The set design is amateur hour. The script, assuming there was one, is laughable. This movie is so bad it barely qualifies as drive-in camp. It, it has all the hallmarks of being funded by the Canadian Film Board and being made by Cronenberg. But for some reason, they gave Dan O'Bannon the job of directing this trash. It's as close to a zero-star movie as you will ever see. Ooh, why a Cronenberg call out there? That's it's kind of, kind of random, kind yeah. of a random Cronenberg reference. <laughs> um, the the guy, the the one before that is interesting. The the second to last review you read, Gary, because they they had a big problem with this movie not adhering to the rules of Romero's movies, but that's kind of one of the more interesting things about this movie to me. Cause you know, in the, in the world of return of the living dead, Romero's movie was based on it. it Romero's movie is a movie and is based on actual events that the details were changed for the movie. And I think that's really clever uh, because it allows O'Bannon to kind of establish his own zombie rules. He's, he's not beholden to Romero's rules. So by creating his own rules, what Return of the Living Dead does is it creates new rules that have sort of become as ingrained in the genre as anything that Romero did. You know, Ro Romero zombies didn't eat brains. They ate flesh. But like a zombie, anytime you see a zombie going brains, like that's indebted to Return of the Living Dead. 
You know, Romero zombies didn't run. O'Bannon's do. Romero zombies didn't burst from the graves because it was always the recent dead. And this, if they're just a skeleton, they're coming from the grave. You can't kill these zombies by, you know, destroying the brains. Even when they get burned up, the smoke goes up into the clouds. It creates an acid rain that creates more zombies. You know, like these guys are unstoppable. And mm. They can use tools. They can talk. I mean, these are all things that Romero's couldn't do that have become staples of the genre, depending on, you know, which movie you're watching or whatever, but they work together. Uh, but the thing is, like, it is, they are completely unstoppable, which does give it a very, like like you said earlier, Dan, a very nihilistic tone. Because even the end of the movie, I mean, Romero's movies aren't exactly like happy endings. The end of Night of the Living Dead is pretty fucking nihilistic, but... They nuke an entire. They nuke the entire city of Louisville, Kentucky, in this movie, and they do it for no reason at all because it doesn't fix the problem. I mean, that's pretty. That's pretty dark. Uh, and let's but, be honest, though, we've. It's not the worst thing they could have done. <laughs> What's like, the worst Louis- thing they could have done? No, I just mean like Louisville kind of sucks. I don't know if you've ever been. L- there. Louisville's not great. <laughs> I was <laughs> just in Louisville. It's actually kind of a cool town. <laughs> it's all right. I just had to make a jab at Louisville. Um, you know, I, I thought at first when I was we watching love this, all of our listeners from Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> by the way. I uh, I thought it it played more into Dan O'Bannon's Dan O'Bannon's mistrust of authority that would just be like the military will just come in and like wipe you out, like kind of yeah, which we well, talked about during Blue Thunder, exactly. Um, but also at the same time, if these assholes would have just called that number in the first place, I wonder if the military would have had to do that. Maybe they could have just contained it to uh, yeah. two zombies and two infected people, and that was yeah. all they had to worry about. It was when they it was when they cremated the body that they caused all the issues. Mm. Well, they're trying to get rid of the evidence, right? They didn't want to call because they're getting trouble, and yeah. then you got to burn the evidence so no one can find out, and then it's and that, that just sort of. A- bigger issue it's yeah. domo effect yeah. yeah so george romero understandably was not happy with the timing of return of the living dead's release uh he was quoted as saying this is a long quote but i'm going to read it all because it's interesting i was reviewed three times for that film entertainment tonight announced it as george romero's return of the living dead even people in florida who had been zombies in day were going to see return of the living dead and they were calling us up and saying Gee, I didn't see any of the Florida stuff. I hated the way the whole thing went down. It was all dirty pool. I never wanted to get into anything like that again. Jack and I were trying to preserve our friendship during it all, and it it got crazy. I think he was screwed as well as everyone else. The film was his and title only. It's a send-up, which is exactly what I worried it would be. That damages your ability to do it straight. I was going to point out, too, that I, I when I was doing research, I found there's a YouTube clip you can find of Romero from the Mystery Channel where he's hosting like a horror night and he does the lead in for Return of the Living Dead. And he talks oh, yeah. about it for a minute. He calls it a spoof of one of his movies, but not like I mean, not I mean, I guess he wouldn't for the show, but he's just kind of like, you know, the next movie is a spoof of one of my movies. It's this and this and this. And he talks about Dan O'Bannon a little bit. And he's like, Dan O'Bannon's a well-respected director in Hollywood and does some amazing things with how he changes, you know, the aspects of uh, some of the stuff we set in motion back with night. And, you know, so he, he's like kind of nice about it. Comes around on it later on. But at the you time, that, I think, think he was a little pissed. With age and perspective. Well, and at the time it was, it was, he, I think he thought it was affecting the box office returns of his own movie that was out at the time. Yeah. You know, so he was probably a little salty about it. Mm-hmm. And oddly enough, uh, John Russo still retained the novelization rights to Return of the Living Dead. So he, you know, he had written the original novel uh, based, he had written a screenplay, ended up turning that into a novel called Return of the Living Dead. The rights got bought up by Tom Fox, got the script got rewritten by Dan O'Bannon, turned into a movie. And then John Russo writes another novelization based on Dan O'Bannon's script to tie in with the film's release. Wow. It's, it's kind of wild. Uh, <laughs> but and it and it was, of course, it was more based on Dan O'Bannon's original script. So there are some differences like Trash's name is Legs, you know. But after the film's success, there was immediate talk of sequels, although Dan O'Bannon was not invited back to direct. Instead, Ken Wiederhorn, director of Shockwaves, uh, was at the helm for Return of the Living Dead Part Two, released in 1988. James Karen and Tom Matthews are the only returning cast members, although obviously they play different characters. 
and there was also there was also an idea for a sequel called Revenge of the Living Dead that was proposed by Don Kalfa, the actor who plays Ernie, and a writer, a friend of his named Roger Carney. So in their treat, they actually wrote up a treatment. In their treatment, it began just minutes after the end of Return of the Living Dead, and it's re- it's revealed that Colonel Glover, the the guy who you know calls in the military strike, uh, he's accidentally destroyed the wrong area, and the survivors minus Bert, who was killed in the explosion, they try to escape the city. So it's kind of a more of a road kind of movie. And he sent the treatment to O'Bannon and Tom Fox and O'Bannon loved it, uh, but he never heard anything from back from Fox and nothing ever went forward. Although I actually found out today that there was a graphic novel uh, created based on this script, but they only made 350 copies. Oh yeah. So now of course it's probably selling on eBay for hundreds of dollars, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but then there was also return of the living dead part three, which was directed by Brian Yuzna. Uh, you know, Brian Yuzna is a longtime collaborator of Stuart Gordon. That was released in 1993, and it's pretty damn good. Uh, part three is fun. Uh, uh, and this is like, memorable to me right now as the original. I love yeah. part three so yeah, much. Part three is fun. It barely has anything to do with the original one other than having Treyox and, and, and zombies. But I think the, the curl is super. If I'm not it's almost mistaken. like a superhero movie. Yeah, it kind of is because she's she basically for anybody who hasn't seen it, like she that it's about a guy. Well, so what it connects to is the colonel from this one. It's his son is dating a girl and they sneak into the military base where they're doing tests with this stuff. And she gets infected. Basically, she starts slowly changing, but she finds out that she could help her addiction to starting to want to eat people with brains by hurting herself. So she like will jam nails through her fingers and uh, slowly over the movie, like to cause herself pain to not want to change completely. She also turns herself into a badass because she's like, got like spikes coming out of her body and like weird yeah. shit. And, nice. But uh, it's kind of fun, but I think it is the same Colonel from the original one. It's his yeah. son in this one. It's pretty fun. So the series lay dormant until 2005 when the fourth and fifth entries were released as sci-fi channel originals, uh, I haven't seen them. Uh, they don't look good. I, I remember when they favorite. came out on sci-fi. I Are they from the director watching... of like um like Eight Legged Freaks or something? I feel like that's right, and I remember not liking them. But you know, who knows? You know what's weird about this movie too? By the way, I know we've been here for forever talking about it, but as much as we're talking about it, as many people as I think have seen this, you know, Dan even mentioned getting the movie on dvd this movie wasn't just like a one of those movies that just came out on dvd like it was it was i feel like it had the cult following and it was very popular in video stores but i read all about a guy named michael allard who was a fan of this movie and he's the whole reason this thing even ever moved past vhs because he early on in the days of doing this he created a website and he consolidated like every review that had ever been written about this movie and like posted them up, started getting in touch with like the actors and stuff and doing interviews and like putting them all on this website, all dedicated to return of the living dead. It ended up getting in touch with Dan O'Bannon and he found out who to contact from MGM who owned the film and got Dan O'Bannon in touch with them and started working it out and they saw like the popularity and the traffic that this site was getting and stuff. And that's what led to the DVD being released. And like, if, if you look at, I forget where it's at, but you can, I mean, Dan O'Bannon gives them credit for the only reason this movie stayed alive. And, oh, that's uh, pretty rad. I mean, this is still definitely much, it definitely still has a, a huge, huge cult following. I mean, this movie, uh, do you guys have any, any ideas for further viewing? Like if you were to, double feature this with something else what would you do uh well honestly to me one of the things and i know i typically don't point out the music but because so much of this watches like a music video like we mentioned uh i would go honestly with uh something we've already covered something else we've already covered in this series heavy metal i think that would be yeah. a lot of fun yeah that makes sense i mean you gotta go Shaun of the dead right it's the only other like mainstream zombie comedy yeah, uh, it'd be a great back to back feature like a Saturday night in the theater. Oh, sure. Yeah, that would be great. That'd be a great double feature as well. Uh, I mean, if you're looking for like fun zombie movies, uh, I would say that new movie that uh, 
that just came out, the one cut of the dead. Like that movie's a blast. Yeah, I fucking love that one. And uh yeah, I mean, I don't know. It just uh zombie movies, it's shot of the dead would be the the immediate go to for sure. See, I kind of lean towards another kind of punk rock genre movie. So it makes me think Sid Nancy. <laughs> make, I, I think uh maybe class of 1984 which yeah, joe bob totally. showed recently oh yeah that would work. or even repo man you know something i was that's just kind of thinking that about repo man when you repo said man that. i think would work really well yeah. uh so uh, that's kind of i think a, a punk rock horror or punk rock genre double feature could be really fun class honestly any like maybe. trauma stuff yeah like uh um, yeah yeah trauma stuff would work so on december 17th 2009 uh, Dan O'Bannon sadly passed away at the age of 63 from complications of the Crohn's disease that had plagued him his entire life uh, since, I mean, at least since back when he made Dark Star nearly four decades earlier. Uh, and at the 2010 Academy Awards, he was actually omitted from the In Memoriam reel, him and Farrah Fawcett that year, uh, even as a guy, you know, the guy who gave us Alien, you know, at least. Even oh, if geez. even if Hollywood didn't acknowledge the other stuff like he's still this is this is the guy who created one of the most influential and respected genre films of all time but even in death he never got the respect that he deserved uh it's, it's kind of a sad story and he was a difficult guy he was angry he was contentious he had a temper but even those with that butted heads with him would never argue that he this guy they they knew he was a genius like he was uh, he had a great mind. He had a great imagination and he deserved better than I think the career that Hollywood gave him. Mm. This is not the end of the road for our Dan O'Bannon discussion. As some of our listeners may have noticed, we we've skipped over some movies of his. We've skipped We haven't talked about total recall or, or his collaborations with Toby Hooper, but all of that's coming in future episodes. In fact, next week we're starting a brand new series where we continue to look at the career of Toby Hooper in his time with Canon Films, beginning with the Dan O'Bannon pen 1985 sci-fi horror flick, Life Force. So that's next week. We're doing three more Toby Hooper episodes, two of which are also a continuation of our Dan O'Bannon series. There's a reason we split up this Toby Hooper stuff. We have a plan here on this show. So next <laughs> week, we're talking about Life Force. It's pretty easy to find, uh, but head to cinemashock.net. You can find out where you can stream it and everything. Uh, but that'll be, I think that's going to be fun because I'm, I, I, personally love life force and i'm excited for you guys to see it because i don't know that either of you have watched that one before no that'll be uh it'll be first time for me so hey dan you want to tell people where people uh where, where our listeners can find film trace and oh yeah absolutely we're all over the place uh so uh we usually respond to comments on youtube so that's <laughs> usually if you want to go to communicate with us uh but uh, yeah all the normal podcast places film traces up we're starting season four uh last week of may we're going to do army of the dead which is premiering in, on netflix and also in theaters starting next week may 14th army of the dead is going to be on uh, theaters so we're going to do a film trace on that in the next couple of weeks uh appreciate you guys having me on yeah man thanks for coming this was fun yeah, it's been fun we Daniel. Will do it again you marathon with top. us love it yeah. dan on dan that's what this episode should be called damn <laughs> daniel uh gary where can you be found on the internet I am at this is Gary Horde on all the stuff. And I'm at uh, Mr. Todd A. Davis on all the socials. And you can find my Star Trek podcast at Computer Resume on all the socials. And where's what's Film Trace's Twitter and all that stuff? Uh, just at Film Trace Podcast. I am at Justin underscore Bishop. The podcast is at Cinema underscore Shock on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, but like us on Facebook, you know, rate review, all that other bullshit that people say at the end of a podcast. And until next week, may the wings of liberty never lose a feather and be excellent to each other. Donnie has the keys and he keeps them in his privacy prosthetic. That's <laughs> <laughs> right. reach. Thanks, every, Don. Every week. <laughs> Are you, do you have a personal Twitter or anything you want to promote? Uh, no, Instagram just a, or yeah, just the film trace stuff.
Yeah, All my other life is hidden. I have a, a hidden life, hidden private I like life. That's a good idea. <laughs> we, we should do that. He's a serial killer. 